May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Today's service is a special service, a service of prayer and reflection. This is built upon a Stations of the Cross service. Traditionally, there are four, 14 stations. Uh, this service will focus on seven. At each station, there will be an image for you to uh, view and to consider as we read a scripture passage, offer a spoken meditation and reflection. There will be a uh, time of silent reflection and meditation for you, and then there will be a prayer. I invite you in this time to consider what it was to move from the Garden of Gethsemane to the crucifixion and tomb. As we prepare for this service, let us begin in prayer. Almighty God, we are gathered here this day as your people, as those who are called out of darkness and into your marvelous light. We are here only because you have loved us. We are committed to being followers of the one who has given so much that we could become sons and daughters of Almighty God. As we contemplate the cross and what it means, we are filled with joy and wonder at the sacrifice Jesus was willing to make to offer us true life, life that breaks death forever. Almighty God, you loved us when we were not lovable. You remain steadfast in your grace, and you call us to follow the example of Jesus, who is the Christ. On this journey, we have stumbled, and we have lost our way, and we know we will again. Sometimes we stumble and we blame others, or we stop following because we're baffled that your way is not our way. And so we cry out to you, O Lord, open to us the way, your way. Shine anew the light of your presence into our lives so strongly that a new love for you will be kindled. Light within us a love that is willing to lay aside privilege and self-centeredness. Spark and grow within us a love that is willing to surrender our fears, our uncertainties, and striving to take on the fullness of what it means to be your disciples. Speak your word. Speak it afresh in our hearts, especially this day as we journey to your cross where we will find life. Amen. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I betray Jesus to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment, he began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Then Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. At once Judas came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. A kiss a sign of loyalty and love. It was the sort of kiss the son might give a father. I wonder why Judas chose to identify Jesus, indeed betray him, with a kiss. Judas could simply have pointed to Jesus a 
called out his name, saying, He's over there. Yet Judas chose a kiss. I wonder if Judas was saying to Jesus, I'm doing this because I'm committed to the coming kingdom and I'm forcing your hand, Jesus, so that you'll reveal your true messianic ministry and call the legions of angels to defeat the Romans. Or perhaps Judas' kiss meant, I once believed in you, but you, Jesus, you betrayed me. You held held out a promise of a coming kingdom, and I bought it. And then you started talking about your death, like a defeated man. I love you, but I can no longer support you. From our perspective, it is easy to condemn Judas. Few people in history have been more despised, and for good reason. I've never heard of another person being named Judas, Yet by heaping such disdain on Judas, we avoid confronting the Judas within ourselves. How many times have we betrayed Jesus? Not in the same way, but in our hearts and our actions. How many times have we confessed Jesus as Lord only to enthrone ourselves as the Lord of our lives? How many times have we worshipped Jesus only to reject him as we live out our lives. As I gaze at these 30 coins, I see how small an amount. And then I consider, for how much less have I betrayed my Lord? Let us pray. Lord, I hate to admit it to myself and certainly to you, but in the multitude of times I have pledged devotion to you and then rejected and betrayed you, I recognize Judas in me. Forgive me. I want to be completely devoted to you, Jesus, but in the day to day challenges of faith, the Judas lurking within me surfaces. And I'm tempted to reject and betray you, and often for less than 30 coins. Enable my eyes to see where my commitment is divided. Grant courage to faithfully reflect your good news in my life. Amen. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus, so they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At least two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? 
You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, He deserves death. Jesus knew that a claim to be Messiah would have been misunderstood as a call for revolution and the reestablishment of the Jewish kingdom. And since Jesus had not raised an army capable of freeing Judea from the Romans, there would be little reason for the members of the Sanhedrin to believe he was, it is, the true waited-for Messiah of God. A revolutionary claim was exactly the sort of thing that got Jews in major trouble with Rome years before. Have you ever wondered why Jesus wasn't clearer about who he was and what he had come to do? I know I have. It seems like it would have been so much easier if Jesus had only said, Yes, I am the Messiah, but not in the way you expect. I have been anointed by God to bring the kingdom, not a military political, but the kingdom that comes through transformed hearts, communities, and cultures. Most of all, the kingdom comes through my death as I bear the sin of Israel, indeed, the sin of the world. But Jesus didn't say this. It's something we piece together from his words and deeds after years of reflection and prayer and growth. Like the people of his day, even his first disciples, we often get all this confused. We rightly reject the notion of Jesus as a military, political messiah, and then we limit his salvific work to post-mortem. Heaven for individual believers rather than transformation of the whole cosmos. When we confess Jesus as the Christ, we proclaim that he came to establish the kingdom of God. And though this kingdom won't fully come until Jesus returns, the kingdom is here even now and is made more visible as our living reflects how we were taught to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let us pray. This kingdom you spoke of and promised doesn't look like the kingdoms with which we are familiar. The Jewish priests and religious officials didn't understand. Your own disciples didn't understand. If we are honest, we struggle to understand. Grant us a sense of your righteousness that does not depend on our understanding and by your Spirit, allow your kingdom to be visible in our work. Amen. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing round it, warming themselves. Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, too. They asked him, 
Are you not also one of his disciples? And Peter denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment... (laughs) Why did Peter deny Jesus? He was one of the first to follow, leaving so much behind to walk the uncertain road of discipleship. He had seen mighty wonders as his master healed the sick, cast out demons, and even raised the dead. Peter had witnessed the miracle of Jesus' transfiguration on the mount. Peter had even walked on water for a few brief moments. Why did Peter, of all people, deny Jesus? It's amazing how fear can overtake us. When we're afraid, we can forget our commitments, our values, our loves. Fear can startle us in the middle of the night and keep us awake. Fear prevents us from striving for our dreams. Fear cripples our souls and binds our hearts. It locks us in prison and throws away the key. Oh, what power fear can have over us. Fear leads us to do what we would otherwise never do, and it keeps us from doing that which we know to be right. In a fearful moment, all we can think of is how to protect ourselves, perhaps at any cost. Peter was full of fear, understandably so. All that he had hoped seemed to be crumbling before him, The one he believed to be the Messiah, the Savior of Israel, was now arrested. Jesus' death seemed certain, and with his death, Peter's reason for living was gone. Jesus had the power to calm a storm, raise the dead to life. Why would he not use that power now? Why didn't Jesus defend himself? And what did that mean for Peter? Fear drove Peter to do what only hours before he swore he would never do. Fear drove Peter to protect himself. So Peter denied his Lord, not once, but three times. Fear has the power to make all of us do or say that which we later regret. Though you and I might never deny Jesus in such a blatant way as Peter did, Fear is the reason we have denied Christ. Have you ever sensed that the Lord was urging you to do something for His sake, but then you could not do it? Have you known what it's like to downplay the significance of your faith in some conversation because you were afraid of what people might think of you? Have you ever let fear keep you from experiencing the fullness of life in Christ? I know. I have to. Too many times to count. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, fear too often directs my relationship with you. Forgive me for all the times I have fallen short because of fear. Forgive me for failing to trust you. Grant us the gift to speak truth, even in the difficult times. Amen.
Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Peter said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus who was called the Messiah. For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? The crowd said together, Let him be crucified. And Pilate asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd. We have a tendency in the telling of Christ's passion story to exonerate Pilate, or at least to make him an unwilling pawn of the Jewish leaders and crowds. We rationalize Pilate's action saying, well, he was caught between a rock and a hard place. Were it not from the pressure he had received from the Sanhedrin and their supporters, he wouldn't have crucified Jesus. But that simply isn't accurate. Pilate's record for dealing cruelly with the Jewish people is far spread. Pilate frequently mistreated those he was sent to govern. One instance is money was given to the Jewish temple and Pilate used it for one of his pet projects. When a crowd objected, Pilate killed a number of Galilean Jews and mingled their blood with their temple sacrifices. It's unlikely that Pilate would have been coerced. Pilate was surely aware of Jesus' widespread popularity. If Pilate had wanted to keep Jesus alive, he surely could have gone over their heads of the Jewish leaders. Pilate didn't need anyone's approval to have Jesus killed. He had the authority to order execution. Pilate knew he faced the possibility of insurrection if he himself was responsible for the death of Jesus. So he found a way to use his authority to crucify Jesus, but at the same time, publicly wash his hands of this decision, making it appear as if he was coerced. Pilate alone had the authority in Jerusalem to sentence Jesus to death by crucifixion, and he must bear this guilt. I see him as a paradigm of the person who fails to take responsibility for his actions. Pilate issued the verdict that sent Jesus to the cross, yet he did, he did this in such a way as to appear innocent. How often do we do this sort of thing ourselves? Rationalizing our sins, blaming others for them. How often do we fail to take responsibility for what we have done wrong, assigning blame to this person or that person? We are each responsible for our own choices. We cannot evade responsibility for our sins by pointing at others. We would do well to remember the words from the first letter of John. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Christ a liar and God's word is not in us. We can try to wash our hands of that which we have done wrong, but God isn't fooled. Let us pray. 
It is so very easy to be like Pilate, O Lord, to rationalize my behavior, to wash my hands of any responsibility for my failures. Forgive me when I am not honest with you or myself. Grant me the courage to acknowledge my sins and to seek your mercy so I might live in your forgiveness and grace. Amen. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him, they took the reed and struck him on the head, After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. And carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. What cruel irony. Jesus, you finally received the words you deserve. Hail, King of the Jews! Finally, you wore a crown upon your head. Yet it was not the crown of sovereignty or the crown of victory, but a crown of suffering, a crown of thorns. I imagine the thorns were long and terribly sharp. No doubt they dug deep into your head. I cringe at the pain, but I'm wounded far more deeply at the humiliation and degradation you suffered. But the very thing you came to offer us as a gift becomes a source of ridicule. I see you accept the cross in the midst of such mockery you could have refused. You began this journey knowing full well where it will lead. I hear no words of complaint, no protestations of innocence, no cursing the injustice. You came to be the kind of king who shepherds his people, who takes responsibility for their well-being, whose principles are faithfulness, justice, and righteousness. It seems people then and now are not ready for that kind of king. For the times I think I am ready, there are questions which I must answer. Am I willing to release my ideas of what the kingdom of God should look like And trade them for your vision and will, Jesus? Am I truly willing to give up my human preoccupation with power and control and instead accept a different kind of crown than I was expecting? Let us pray. Lord, did you really choose the cross? I mean, yes, the Jewish leaders accused you. Yes, Pilate sentenced you. Yes, the Roman soldiers led you to Golgotha. But in a very real sense, you were working out what God had willed and what you had freely and painfully chosen. Lord, did you really choose the cross so I could take up life in all of its fullness? Did you really take the abuse so I can receive glory? You were led to die. 
And now I can be led to life eternal. Empower me to honor you as king of all my life and all I do. Amen. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus. King of the Jews. Oh, how I do not want to see this. Yet I force myself to watch. I hear the sharp ping of a hammer against nail. It makes me shudder. It sounds so final. Is this really how it will end? Jesus, did all those wonderful lessons you taught me mean anything? You spoke of being a light to the world, but it seems that darkness is winning. I want to rage at the injustice of this, the cruelty of the Romans, the hypocrisy of the high priests and religious leaders, the treachery of Judas, the cowardice of the disciples, the fickleness of the crowds. Do they not remember that you cared for their illnesses and ailments? that you spoke of a loving God and loving one another as the first and best commandment? Do they not remember of bearing the burdens of others, even loving our enemies? They should know better. They should have listened and learned. But as I ask these questions, I have to wonder, would I have acted any different? Is the guilt just of those who drove the nails and the rest of us are innocent? Or is it human sin, my sin, that drives the nails? I want to pretend that it is someone else's guilt, someone else's sin. But if I am honest, Jesus, you were on this cross, accepting your death because of my sin. I was there. It was I who drove the nails. Let us pray. Remind me, O Lord, of the deathly cost of sin, and perhaps then I may understand more fully the depth and breadth of your love. May this dark night become fertile soil for growth in your love, growth in us as a community of faith, May this night teach us how to love you and all your children as you have loved us. Out of the darkness, O Lord, bring a light of a new dawn. Amen.
When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate ordered Jesus' body to be given to Joseph. So he took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. Joseph then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Joseph was a member of the Sanhedrin, but it seems very clear that he was also a follower of Jesus. It must have been very important to Joseph to bury Jesus properly. He gave up his own rock-hewn tomb, a surprisingly good burial for someone who was crucified. In a different gospel telling, we learn that 100 pounds of aloes and myrrh were used, equivalent to more than $250,000. A huge amount, and yet a drop in the bucket compared to what Jesus paid. Standing outside of this tomb, looking at the huge stone rolled in front of the tomb, a final sign of the permanence of death. I asked Jesus, whose hands, feet, and sides still bear the signs of this journey, Lord, grant me the graces I need to take up my cross and follow you. Lord, enable me to put to death all that does not bring glory to you, my Lord. Let us pray. O Lord, this day seems to be all about death. I mean, what else is it when you are arrested, accused, beaten, betrayed, crucified, and laid in a tomb? But as we look a little closer, we discover it's really all about life. Integrity unbowed by convenience. Love unhindered by hatred. Humility undeterred by power. Truth untainted by lies. And real, vibrant, fearless life breaking through. You died, Jesus, because you refused to settle for anything less than genuine eternal life for all. Lord Jesus Christ, we hope for the dawning of a new day. In death, O oh God, usher new beginnings. But for now, there's nothing more to see. Darkness fills the world, and the tomb is sealed. Amen.